there's a word from the Lord. First John chapter four. If you were in the becoming session, this would be your second time today leaning into first John chapter four. We did this in the becoming session, not the exact same passage of scripture, but we were in chapter four. I want to lean into verse uh, verse seven through verse 12. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, and when you found it, if you're in the building, you can say amen. amen. Those watching via the live stream will take it for granted that you have found the passage, and we will proceed. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, 1 John chapter 4 in verse 7 you'll find these words, reading down to verse 12. Very affectionate language. John says, beloved. Using inclusive language, let us love one another. What's the source of love, John? For love is from God, and everyone who is born of God, one of God's children, and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this love of God, by this, excuse me, the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Who initiated love? Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the appeasement for our sins. Eleven, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. Or it is brought to its fullest expression when we actually love one another. That's the goal of God's love within us. It is for us to love one another. Let us pray. Oh, wise and eternal God, we thank you for today. Thank you for enriching our lives in ways that we would never be able to experience on our own. Thank you for your love that you have deposited within us by way of your Holy Spirit. And that one of the fruit of the Spirit is love. And we thank you for the ability and the capability to love other people in the way that you have loved us. May we never forget that we should never go around here claiming that we know you and we are in a close relationship with you and we've never seen you and then we don't even love the people that we can see. Have mercy on our souls today, dear God, and may someone who is saved be edified through the message and the one who is not saved be saved. It is in Christ Jesus' name that we pray, amen. I want to talk about building better relationship with Christians, building better relationship with Christians. Now, as I talk about this, and I talk about this love that we should have for one another, it's not just limited to the Christian family, but if there's any place where love ought to be, it ought to be in the Christian family. Evelyn Johnson was a member of New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. Every Sunday... Evelyn would arrive at the same time, park in the same parking space. Longtime members of New Zion Missionary Baptist Church, they knew not to park in Evelyn's parking space. She didn't have a name on the parking space, but she had claimed it for herself many years ago. One Sunday, Evelyn was running late, unbecoming of her because she was always on time. And one of the new members parked in her parking space. When Evelyn arrived at church, she noticed that someone had parked in her parking space and immediately became enraged. 
Evelyn drove to the front of the church building, got out, walked in, and asked the usher did she know who had parked in her parking space. Now the usher saw Cynthia pull into Evelyn's parking space, but she didn't say anything because she wanted to see how it was going to all go down. Therefore, the usher whispered back to Evelyn the new member's name. She said, Cynthia parked in your parking space. Now, Evelyn didn't know Cynthia. And so she says to the usher, can you go tell Cynthia that I need to talk to her? And when the usher tapped Cynthia on the shoulder, she relayed the message from Evelyn. She said, Evelyn want to talk to you outside. And Cynthia looks up at the usher and says, can this wait? because I'm trying to worship, if you would just let me. The usher looked back down at Cynthia and she said, uh-uh, Evelyn want to talk to you right now, and she said it's urgent. As soon as Cynthia walked outside, Evelyn proceeded to scold her for parking in her parking space. She told Cynthia, she said, I've been a member of New Zion Missionary Baptist Church for over 30 years, and I I got every right to claim this parking space as my own. Cynthia responded by saying, I know you've been a member of this church a whole lot longer than I have, but that parking space doesn't have your name on it, and I got every right to park in that parking space. She said, you act like you own the parking space. Evelyn said, you're right. You don't have my name on it, but I've been coming to this church a whole lot longer than you have. And I've given a whole lot more money than you have as well. And she said, I know that because Centoria or whatever your name is, I work in the finance committee. And I promise you, I know for a fact, I give more money than you. Cynthia was devastated at Evelyn's behavior. She went back into the church, got her kids out of the nursery, went and got in the car and made her way home with the intention never to return to New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. After service ended, Pastor Clemens got wind of what happened, and so he called Cynthia to talk to her, to try to console her, and to try to get her to come back to church. And Cynthia said, if you really want to know what happened, ask your longtime member what happened, and hung up the phone. When Pastor Clemens called Evelyn and confronted her about what happened, he wanted her to apologize to, to Cynthia. Just simply apologize. Evelyn refused to apologize. She said, I ain't do nothing wrong. She said, not only did I not do anything wrong, Pastor Clemens, but if you bring this up again, I promise you Cynthia won't be the only one that leaves New Zion Missionary Baptist Church. I promise you that because I got enough family members to make it happen. On the one hand, this is a story that I wrote to open today's message. It's just a story. I didn't choose the names to cover anybody's name. But on the other hand, it's more than just a story. It's a story that represents the attitude and the behavior present within many local churches. Local churches now ought to be places where people can testify that is full of love compassion, and the love of God and the love of Christ. But as I stand here today, I wouldn't be truthful if I said that local churches can be some of the most unloving, cold, indifferent, uncompassionate, and uncaring places. I'm not talking from secondhand information. I've been pastoring for almost 25 years. And over the years, I witnessed incidents where I needed to intervene when people who say that they know Christ actually acted as though they didn't. I can't leave myself out. At times, I know over the years, my attitude, my behavior at times has not been indicative of a person who says they know Christ and is supposed to have the love of God in my heart. And I imagine as you sit there pondering this story and my testimony, you can relate as well. You've been on both sides of this story. On one hand, you've known or you watched someone in a local church maintain an attitude or behavior 
that was not indicative of a Christ-like attitude and behavior. But on the other hand, you've been the person who's had an attitude, who's had a behavior toward another brother or sister in Christ that did not resemble light, but it resembled darkness. It didn't resemble that of love, it resembled that of hatred. It didn't resemble that of affection and kindness, but animosity. And please don't act like you've never been on the other side. I've discovered that it's not hard to be on that side of where we should not be toward a brother or sister in Christ. In a Zoom session on last week, actually it was a Zoom session we had in regards to birthday celebration, and I asked the group that was in this session, I said, share with me at least one thing that makes it difficult for you to love another brother or sister in Christ. And people <laughs> immediately started leaning into things that makes it difficult for them to love a brother or sister in Christ. And someone said, it's hard for me to love somebody to act like they know everything. Somebody else said, it's hard for me to love somebody that's always negative. They ain't never talking about nothing positive, always negative. I don't even want to be around them, Pastor. Somebody else said, it's hard to love people when the person you're trying to love won't listen to you. Another person said, it's hard to love somebody who rejects the love that you're trying to give to them. Somebody else said it's hard to love someone when it's hard to get past yourself. I pause for effect. Sometimes the difficulty in loving other people is not on them. It's just simply on us because of who we are. Ideally, none of these attitudes, none of these perspectives should be present in a local church, but the reality is everything that I just previously mentioned is a part of local churches in the 21st century. Here's a critical point that I want you to understand today. The same Christians who struggle with loving other Christians are oftentimes quick to say how much they love the Lord. What some people fail to realize is that Loving God requires loving others in his family. In 1 John chapter 4, in verse 7 through 12, the apostle John helps us to understand the truth that loving God requires loving others in his family. For a few minutes, I just want to lean into these few verses that we have before us that can show us how to create an environment that is loving, that's, a, that's kind, that's affectionate and that's, that's Christ-like. What, what, what is it that John says that can help us to create this environment that we so desperately need in our local churches? Well, the first thing that John says is that we need more than earthly love. If you look at the text, verse number seven, the A portion, John opens up with this word of deep affection and love. When he says, beloved, let us love one another. For love is from who? Who is love from? John says, because of the verb being in the present text, we need to keep loving one another. Love shouldn't be sporadic. It should be something that we keep doing and we keep on doing and we keep on doing. And when we think we've loved enough, we keep on loving. John says, we do that not with an earthly love, but with a love that's beyond the earthly realm, that comes from a higher plane. Love is from God. Amen. And because of that, it's unnatural. It's unnatural. Actually, it's supernatural. And we need that type of supernatural love if we're going to love our brothers and sisters in Christ the way that we're supposed to love them. If you're challenged with loving someone that opposes you, somebody that's trying to do harm to you, somebody that's ignoring you, somebody that's trying to break your trust is somebody that's, that's engaging in character assassination, somebody that, that's, that's going all out to make your life a living hell. Guess what type of love you're going to need? You're going to need something beyond earthly love. Because if you try to love them through earthly love, that may fail and you may cuss them out. <clears throat> if you try to love them through earthly love, that may fail and you may take revenge into your own hands. Amen. I won't stay there long. The reality is we need a love that's beyond earthly love. We need a divine love. We need a godly love. 
if we're not careful, and we just simply love people out of earthly love, that love fails, and we stop loving people unconditionally, and we don't love people who may be different than we are. That's the issue sometimes, is that the person that it's hard for us to love them, they're just so much different than we are. It's not that they've done anything wrong, they're just so different than we are. I read an interesting story about that, this famous architect who designed some unusual buildings. He built a library that had an extremely low ceiling. And if you were six feet tall and not careful, you would keep bumping your head in this room. And a man who was having trouble with this, having issues, asked the teacher, what, what's going on with this? Why did he create the building this way? And the teacher said, one of the characteristics of this architect is that he hated tall people. And so therefore, the architect in his attempt to level things out would cut people down to his size by making the ceilings so much lower. Sometimes people do the same thing in the church. Sometimes people do the same thing in their families. Sometimes people do the same thing on their job. They try their best to cut you down to size so that they can bring you down to their level. Husbands do it to wives. Wives do it to husbands. Parents do it to children. Children do it to parents. Friends do it to friends. Co-workers do it to co-workers. Cut folk down to bring them down to their size. But when we love people unconditionally and in spite of their differences, we don't try to cut people down to bring them down to our size. We accept them and we love them. Let me stick, let me stick something in here that don't mean you have to compromise with sin. Amen. That I'm not saying you have to compromise with sin and stuff that is wrong, that biblically is wrong. But there's some folk that you're going to have to accept them and there's so much differences that you may have with the individual. Loving God requires loving others in his family. The second thing that John shows us in this text is that we need a love beyond earthly love, but we also need love that's experiential love. If you look back in verse number seven, the B portion, and verse number eight, John says this. John says, we have this supernatural love of God dwelling within us, proves that we belong to God, and it proves that we know God. <laughs> because the ones who don't love the way God loves, guess what they really don't know? Really don't know God. See, the word know comes from the Greek word gnosko, which is experiential knowledge. And one thing that you have not experienced, if you cannot love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you have not experienced the love of God. Because if you truly know God and you've experienced his love, you will go beyond natural love and love people who at times seem so unlovable. The person who fails to experience God's love is more inclined to engage from a position of selfishness, prejudice, pride, anger, abuse. Criticism, hatred, mistreatment. The only way that we can overcome these inclinations is to experience God through his divine love. One day a distinguished preacher was visiting a large group of inmates in a penitentiary trying to emphasize the importance of love and personally experiencing Love or personal involvement, let me just stop there. Personal involvement. He said, if I wanted to learn to swim, I could approach the project several ways. He said, I could read a good book on the subject. I could talk to an expert swimmer. I could watch some good uh, swimmers swimming in the process. Maybe learn how to swim. He said, I could even write a best-selling book on swimming. He said, but if I wanted to learn how to swim, what would I do? He paused for a moment before he gave the punchline. But he didn't have to give the punchline because 
The big fella sitting out in the audience with a big smile on his face shouted it out for the preacher. This is what he shouted. Hit the water, brother, and start swimming. That's a word for us today. A lot of people have read books about, about God. They talked to theologians about God. They watched other people live a godly lifestyle. They've even written best-selling books about God. But the one thing they failed to do is hit the water. To know God, we've got to hit the water. One of the ways that we hit the water is to take the love that he's given us and share it with other people. Every time we love somebody else with divine love, guess what we're doing? We're hitting the water. Let me say it again. To know God, you've got to hit the water. And until you hit the water, you really don't know God. Loving God requires loving others in his family. Two more things, I'm done. Number three, John says, we need an example of love. I love this. Verse 9, verse 10, John says, by this love of God was manifested in us. By this, the love of God was manifested in us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If there's any place in this message where we ought to get excited, ought to be right here. I mean, if you ain't able to get excited about this, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what else. It's going to get you excited. We should rejoice because God gave us a perfect example of how to love. What's the example? God didn't love us in theory. God loved us in practice. God loved us when there was nothing about us to make him love us. Did you catch that? He didn't love us when we were at our best. He loved us when we were at our worst. What did, what did Paul say in Romans 5 and 6 through 8? This is what he said. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. We wasn't at our best, we were at our worst. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps son would dare even die for a good man. I love this. But God demonstrated his love. That while we were yet sinners at our worst, not at our best, what did Christ Jesus do? He died. That's why I say you ought to get excited. Because there was nothing about you. You were sitting up in the window for sale. And there was nothing about you that made God need to get excited. Uh-uh. It was nothing about you. God looked at himself and said, I love you. Even though ain't nothing about you to make me love you. You, you ever seen some folk with somebody and you look at them and you like, what they doing with them? You don't want to be honest, do you? You, you don't want to be honest. <laughs> you know you done looked at a couple together and it's like, well, what do you want her for? What does she want to do with what she got him for? Ma, it must be the money, amen. Because I don't see nothing. Well, when, when you think about God looking at you, it wasn't nothing. It was because of his love. You didn't even initiate the love. God initiated the love. Is that not what John said? He loved us before we ever loved him. We wouldn't come to God. There was nothing in us that, that made us come to God. He came to us first. How do we know that? Because John said he sent his son. He sent his son to die for our sins. There was nothing that we could do to make God love us, to deserve God. Loving us in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He put on human flesh. John says in his gospel, he dwelt among us. Do you not understand the implications of God putting on human flesh? That means he had to come into this world. Let me say it again. That means he had to come to this world, an ungodly world, yes. messy world. But guess what God does? He specializes in getting in the mess. 
I love a story that I've told numerous times to illustrate the idea of God getting in the mess. And it's a story about a family gathering when babies started crying in the playpen. The reason why the baby was crying is because the baby's diaper was sold. Now the mother heard the baby crying. It was going to move to do something about it. But her father, the baby's grandfather, also heard the baby crying. And because of his love for his grandson, he made a move toward the playpen. But as he made a move toward the playpen, his daughter looked at him and said, don't take that baby out of that playpen. You leave him right where he is. I'm going to get all of the stuff to change his diaper. So you leave him right where he is. He's going to be all right. I know he's crying, but he's going to be all right. And the mother turned to go get the stuff to change the diaper. And she looked back one more time and she said, remember what I told you. Don't take him out of that playpen. She went and got the stuff, and as she turned around to come back, one of the first things that she saw was she saw her father throwing his leg over in the playpen. <laughs> because the father said, if I can't take him out of this mess, then I'm going to get in the mess with him then. Oh, ain't you glad that when we were in our mess, God said, I'm not going to take you out of the mess, but I throw my leg over into the world's playpen and I get in the mess with you. If you ain't excited yet, I don't know what's going to excite you to know that God threw his leg over in the playpen. Got in the mess with you. He's our propitiation. It's a theological term that I don't want you to be offended by. Don't think it's too much for you to understand. Propitiation, appeasement. Because of our sin, the wrath of God was coming against us. Let me see if I can do it this way. How many of you have children? Okay, you got children. And you say to your child, don't touch that. You just bought it, it costs a thousand dollars. And when you turn your back, they go touch it. Not only do they touch it, but they break it. And it was the last one they had. Aren't you upset? Somebody got to pay, don't they? Yes. Because of our sins, somebody had to pay. Somebody had to be punished. But again, aren't you glad that the punishment you should have received, that I should have received, God put that on his son. How did he put it on his son? At Calvary. He took that punishment. He took that whipping with nails in his hand, nails in his feet, thorn on his head, crown of thorns on his head. He died to take the punishment. We should. When he was being whipped, that should have been us. But he took that. That appeased God's wrath. Now, that's the work of God in Christ. I'm coming to the last thing, but I got to put this in your spirit. Because of that, there's a difference between our religion and the other religions of this world. A neighboring Christian communicated that to his neighbor very well, who was of another religion. He said, there's a difference between your religion and my religion. Your religion is two words. My religion is four words. The neighbor says, I don't understand. 
The Christian says, let me help you. Your religion is two words, do. My religion is four words, done. You got to understand that in your religion, you got to do something to be right. In my religion, for me to be right has already been done. When you think about propitiation, when you think about the sacrifice of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it was for the righteousness of God. I don't have to do anything to be right. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection gives me the righteousness that I need. Do I live out that righteousness? Yes, I do. But there's no more righteousness that I get than when he gives it to me. And I'm justified. And I'm made right with God. It's not a religion of do. It's a religion of done. It's already done. Loving God requires loving others in his family. Last thing I'm done. John says in verse 11, verse 12, if we're going to have this love in the body of Christ, it means embodying embodying love continually here it is John says beloved if God so loved us we ought to do what we ought to do what love one another I'm just making sure what's the excuse then for someone not loving others hmm What's the excuse for someone not loving unconditionally and sacrificially? We know how we're supposed to love. We had the example. I've talked about that. Here's the problem. Application. Are you applying what you know? Are you applying the exact? It's not a choice. Well, Pastor, I can choose if I want to. No. This is not optional. It's obligatory. It's essential. I keep hearing somebody say, but pastor, when it comes to loving people who are difficult to love, I ain't there yet. Well, you need to understand that when you don't love those who seem to be so difficult, you're holding up God's purpose for his love. 1 John 4 and 12, John says God's love is perfected in us. When we love others, the word perfected comes from a Greek word that means to bring to bring to a completion. It's not that we finish the work of love, but we bring it to its fullest expression. When we take the love that God loves us with and we use that to love other people, that's the fullest expression of divine love. If you're listening to me right now, don't skip over something else that John says in verse 12. In verse 12, he says, no one has seen God at any time. This is the same John who wrote in John 1 and 18, no one has ever seen God, but the Son has revealed him, has explained him. That means that God, through his son, revealed himself to us. Now, the son is gone. How does God reveal himself now? Because folks still can't see him. But yet they can. They can see God through you. You see God through me. But if we don't love the way God loves, guess who they won't see? They won't see God through you. Somebody else may love in love with the love of God, and they may see God through them, but they won't see God through you. So therefore, when you love another person with God's love, you have this, and I want to, I want to, you have, I have this awesome privilege of doing what the son did. And that is revealing God to people who can't see God, but yet they can see God through you. And when people 
can see God, it can give them some hope that they may not have had before. We need to understand today the power of a loving community. Have you ever thought about it? I love being in a loving community because being in a loving community, I don't have to do anything to be accepted. People accept me with my faults, my shortcomings, all of my mess up. I don't have to perform to be accepted because I'm in a loving community. Because I'm in a loving community, I can trust that people are going to forgive me when I do mess up. Because I'm in a, in a loving community, I know people are not going to hold grudges against me. Amen. Because I'm in a loving community, I know I have brothers and sisters who, whenever I'm treated unjustly or somebody's mistreating me because of their love for me, they're going to step up and say what needs to be said and what needs to be done. That's because I'm in a, in a loving community. And I want to pause and challenge you to think about the benefits that you have of being in a loving community of faith. And if you're not in a loving community of faith, you need to get in one. How many of you feel as though you're in a loving community of faith? I grew up in a loving community of faith. I grew up in a loving church. Before I passed the Trinity, I was a member of Trinity. <laughs> grew up in Trinity. It's a loving church. And then one day I had to step outside of this loving community and start pastoring and going in other churches, and it was a wake-up call. Because <laughs> I was like, man, what's going on? It was a culture shock. And I, and I thought back on my many days of being in a loving community of faith and what that did for me. If you're ever in one, you better appreciate it. Because there are some churches, there are some churches that they wear the name church, they bear the name Christians, but they're not loving communities. And you see the evidence of it. That is the word for today. The latest note to come. You do know the hardest thing about this message, right? Mm -hmm. It's doing what it says. That's right. Love one another. Love one another. And as I'm saying that, somebody is putting up butt. And that is because that's going to be the hardest thing about this message. Not, not trying to understand what John is saying. You know what John is saying. Love one another. That's right. But take that out. Just love one another. Doors of the church are open. You can come by letter baptism or Christian experience, as I've said earlier, in how you connect with Trinity.